your next big move podcast for anyone involved in the buying and selling of businesses that wants to know how to do it right. Hosted by Zorin and brought to you by Exclusive Business Sales. Sell your business with certainty. Hello, everyone. Today, my guest is Mark Attard. Mark has been selling businesses for over 13 years and through his career has been involved in sale of many accounting practices. We talk about specifics for accounting practice sales, valuations, and many other aspects of selling these types of businesses. Anyone thinking of selling or buying accounting practice will find useful information in this conversation. So let's get into it. Hi, Mark. How are you doing? Good morning, Zaren. Good to be here. <laughs> is it morning? <laughs> hey, so what I want to talk to you today is about accounting practice, selling accounting practices and selling accounting businesses in general. Sure. So it would be a good place to start. We were talking earlier. And maybe why do people sell accounting practices? It's, it's kind of a little bit different to other businesses, isn't it? Yeah, I think uh, in, in most cases people get to retirement um, and they generally t- think about re- uh, selling accounting practices over many years and never feel like it's the right time. Okay. But they do get to the right time eventually. Um, see, in normal business sales, retirement is probably 20% of yeah. the cause of selling it, while in accounting practices, uh, I dare to say 90%. At least 80%, 80%, if not 90 yeah. yeah. Um, another interesting thing, and you <laughs> just touched on that, is that people the, the start thinking or contemplating, not thinking, but contemplating or starting making decisions for many, many, many years before they, they sell the business. I, I know in our, in our business, we got an accountant, we have an accountant, we have accountants that we've been talking for, more than 10 years now about selling and <laughs> they're well, still not ready to you retire. You have to realise that accounting uh, people are very methodical and like to think things through and assess the risk of everything. So it's not, so it's not something you wake up one morning and say, I'm going to sell my accounting practice. Generally, they're, sp- they're talking to people over a period of five, even 10 years, I've seen people. And, and also they... they <laughs> It's a type of business that you can take for a long time. It keeps you active. It keeps you engaged. So it's not uncommon that people stay there, still run practices in their eighties. I've I've actually had some practices where the owners was in his eighties. Yeah, and still going. And it well beyond, um, you know, where the, the time that he should have been there. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It I, was, I, I not well, uh, and it was difficult because you know the, the transition was. Shorter than it should have been. But they just don't want to let go. <laughs> no, the, often they have good relationships with their clients. They're like, like their friends, their family, and uh, it's hard to let that go. And and that becomes a problem when you're selling accounting practices because there's a lot of relationship between principle of the practice and a lot of the clients, especially bigger clients, because they maybe started with them when they were really really small, and now they got large companies, large businesses. How's that handle? What's the best way to go about it to actually pass on these clients to to purchase it to the new owner? Well, look, in in most cases, the retiring owner doesn't want to, you know, give up and stay at home. <coughs> Nine times out of ten, they're happy to help a new owner. They're happy to stay on on a contract. They don't particularly want to be inputting numbers and doing the tax returns, but to stay on to keep the relationships alive. They're generally happy to do that. so And that's very valuable for an um, incoming owner. Mm-hmm. And how long is that process of somebody coming into the business, uh, when somebody buys a business, how long the existing owner has to stay with the purchase of the business to facilitate that handover? What's the common practice? What's a good practice? Tell me a bit about it. Look, for a normal business, we know, like, you know, a month, up to two months. Uh, it can be much longer. It can be six or... <coughs> six months to a year, we, we just had one which was engineering company where the owner staying for two years because very, very specialised skill that you needed. But in general, it's, you know, month, not years. Yeah, a month and then beyond that, the expectation is the outgoing owner gets paid something. But with an accounting practice, you know, a year is probably a good um, minimum time. And generally it's a case of if the owner and the new owner 
are getting on well, why wouldn't you keep him on longer term on a contract? Well, that's one thing, but the other thing, the seller wants to exit because he wants to retire. If he wants to keep on working in the practice, he'll keep the practice. True, he's, but he's not looking for 60 hours a week. He's looking for three days a week, okay. two hours a day. Okay. You know, just, just to keep his hands... Uh, well, it's possible to sell a practice <coughs> and exit. It is 100%, possible, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's more a case of the outgoing owner wanting to do that too. Okay. Yeah. And uh, um, so I know that, and you know, the retention... So, so normally, in normal business sales, there, there could be some deferred payment, but it's a common practice to have a retention... Well, 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 selling accounting practice and retention rever refers to retention of the client. So I'll pay you, we're going to agree on the sum and I'm going to pay 80 or 90% of that. And then in 12 months, we're going to compare this with um, turnover that we thought that we should achieve for that year. And if it's a lower, I'm not going to pay last 10 to 20%. And if it's, if it's achieved, I, I release that money. Um, with this uh, retention, is it is it common practice? Is it is it? I'd say it happens all the time. It does. It, look, it's 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 part of the industry, um, and generally, you know, the risk is less if the uh, outgoing owner stays with the business for at least that retention period, because then he can keep an eye on the clients, he can make sure they're being serviced right, he can uh, address any problems during that period. So, if I was an owner selling a business and there was a 12-month retention, I would stay at least for that 12 months. To make sure that... You're going to get your last 10% or last 20%. 10%, yeah. And you know, that when we talk about retention, we're talking probably between 10 and 30% at so, the outside. So so is it a 10 or 30%? So if the business is a million dollars, that's the difference between 100 and 300,000 that you're getting sometime yes. in the future. What determines if it's a 10 or 30%? Well, look, uh, generally if it's a 30%, there's a higher risk. So it might be a case of uh, there might be two or three large customers that represent 20 or 30% of the turnover. Okay. And you're worried about one, two or three of those exiting the business. It would be devastating for a, a buyer for that to happen. Mm -hmm. So... Where you've got a good spread of clients and you don't have any heavy reliance, maybe the need for that retention could be as little as five or ten percent. Okay. So maybe you know, say say you had a practice that's got ma majority high returns, average uh, fee income two fifty, three fifty. You know, I think the risk of losing those clients is um, is minimal, particularly if you're keeping the same staff because. Generally, the owners doesn't have a relationship with every client. Just to clarify, our returns are individual returns. So these are not the business right. returns. These are tax returns that you that yeah. you do for for the in individuals. So let uh, me just clarify as well. With with when we talk about I returns, we're talking about pure I returns that aren't directors of companies. Yeah, because Most if you've got a business, you're probably going to do tax returns. You group it. You group yeah, it. Group so, it. You're do tax you know, you've got a company with a, a turnover of $10 million, two directors, you're doing their personal returns, you're doing their wife's personal return. You group it all together, that's a business return. Okay. All right. So they, they, yeah. they, they, that's that's considered business return. Yeah. yeah. But that's class as one client group. And from the buyer's point of view, what's more attractive, individual or business uh, clients or it doesn't really matter? Uh, by far, the business client is the most valuable. By far. So yeah. they, they, they pay more for that? They'll pay a lot more for that. Um, in fact, I've had situations where people have looked at practices with, you know, 50% I returns by, by revenue and 50% business returns and they've tried to pick it and, and say, I'll, I'll just take the business returns. Okay. And well, what happened in that case? It's difficult because, you know, the outgoing owner is then stuck with, you know, two sales. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair enough. So, you know, you, you really got to take the uh, business returns with the I returns. The best you can do is maximise the business returns. So you, I've seen groups where the business returns represent 80% or 90% of the turnover. That's as good as it, get, as it gets. Mm -hmm. But then you get other less attractive propositions, propositions where 80% of the turnover is I returns. 
and that won't be attractive attractive to everyone. It affects the price, but there are people that will buy those high returns because that's what they specialise in. Definitely. Some, you know, larger groups, franchises, or I've seen accounting <coughs> practices that only do high returns and they're quite happy. But yeah, it's it's uh, they're still saleable. It's yeah. just a different level of price. Okay. Now, one thing that happens in accounting, uh, in sale of accounting practices that doesn't happen in most of other businesses is they look at the, the price of them, it's based on revenue. Uh, everywhere else we're looking at the profits, or most of other cases we're looking at the profits, but accountants, by far, it's always a revenue. What, why is that the case? Look, to some extent, that's the correct. It just seems to be a rule of thumb everyone um, works on, and it does work. Um, so generally, my um, in my head, it works this way: up to a million dollars of revenue, you can you can do that. You can put a dollar value per for an I return, a dollar value for a business return. But when it gets over a million dollars of turnover, you know they're, they're bigger practices. It really comes back to the uh, EBIT, the the profit of the business after the owner's wage, and generally, it settles at around three times the EBIT. And that kind of works together. Generally, e- either it doesn't matter which method you 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 use, you end up with a very similar generally value on the end. Yeah. Unless, unless if you've got a, a practice that's skewed skewed way out, like you know, ninety ninety five percent high returns, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, the the issue there is the reason is over a million dollars. Um, you know, you can't you can't adjust the uh, the pricing if you're if you're selling your services under market, and uh, and I've seen this before where you know someone's turning over a million dollars of turnover, but only making after the owner's wage one hundred and fifty two hundred thousand. It, it's just not enough to justify, uh, you know, a, a dollar for a dollar uh, transaction transaction or, or payment. Yeah. Yeah. So you really need to get it to uh, you know. You need to get it to at least 30, 35% um, Look, profitability. So so that's what they generally run on 30 to 35%? In my experience, yes. Good accounting practice. I, I've seen some as high as 60%. Oh. But, 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 um, it, but it's rare. Two, it's but, r- they, but they've got two clients. <laughs> no, no, it's more about how much the owner wants to do. Mm-hmm. So if the owner's taking on a lot of the, a lot of the responsibility and the importing and, and the documentation yeah, but you side, still have to allow... For the owner's salary, salary. So if the owner's putting ridiculous hours, sixty, eighty hours, well, then, then his fair market wage is going to be higher. So your sixty percent is not going to be sixty percent anymore. True. Um, and ha- how's the market for accounting practices in general? I'd have to say it's still good. Like um, it's a um, it's a seller's um, it's a seller's market out there. Um, in fact, in some cases, we don't even need to advertise them. We've got a you know a database of people that we can go to to generate interest, and it's not uncommon to have fifty or sixty people inquiring about the same business in a matter of days. Within days, yeah. yeah. Um, what I found with this is often people call me and said, "Look, oh, we're looking to buy a small practice, maybe half a million dollars worth of fees and." If you got something, you know, let us know and we'll look into it. And my advice to them is don't wait until practice is available for you to get ready. Get ready, get money in place, get everything because they move so quickly. You don't have luxury of time. We're talking here weeks or days to make a decision and get into it because if you thinking of long due diligence and you're going to spend a couple of months and then another two months to find the money, think again, it's just going to go to somebody else. You really have to be ready. Uh, Very it, true. Like one of the questions we uh, often to, to screen through our potential b- purchases, we we ask one what their circumstances are so, so um, to see that there's a fit there for this practice, but also, you know, the, the situation with finance or whether they've got cash to purchase a, a practice. And that's not because... You're trying to save everyone's time, really, because 
uh, you're going to spend time and money on the due diligence and everything else, but you're going to miss out because you can't move. Uh, well, look, you know, s- sometimes you get to the end of a negotiation and you find out that the purchaser doesn't have money and requires vendor finance. Well, you know, it, it's no, you know, it's a lot of time wasted for nothing. Uh, which I find really interesting while you're selling accounting practices, they don't have the money because the banks readily lend against accounting practices and tried before this talk to figure out what the current ratios are because whole things is happening. But it seems to be about 60, maybe even higher percent on the fees. So if you've got something that's rated a million dollars, bank will give you 600. But if you've got a very similar business and you're an accountant, you can actually, uh, against both fees, borrow 100% of the money. And I find every time in any industry when the money becomes available, the prices, well, the, the market becomes buoyant and the prices are uh, pushed out. And that's been, uh, dare to say, it's been the case with accounting practices now for for good, well, forever. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, 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 think it, I think as a banker that, that uh, most bankers think, uh, you know, it, it doesn't come much safer than... Uh, Lending an accounting, to sending, lending to an accounting lending practice. To and, an accountant. You know, rarely do they fall over. Um, there some has to be something severely wrong for an accounting practice to fall over. And look, in in saying that, we've had some in liquidation, but often it's not the accounting practice that's a problem. It's you know other interests like property development, yeah, stuff outside that happens. That, that or or an accountant thinking that you know he'll do another business at the same time, and that brings him undone. But even in liquidation, they they, they seem to hold the value. Uh, one thing when we're talking about a handover earlier, you, you hand so, so you got a new new buyer, a new, new business owner handing over, uh, taking over business from the old owner, and uh, often people say, "Well, I'm going to lose a lot of clients." A buyer is really afraid about losing clients. But think about it. All right, let's say your accountant sells his practice, and he introduces you to. Joe and Joe is now a new owner. <laughs> You're not going to just grab your file <laughs> and run out of the door and then start looking for the new accountant. You're going to say, okay, I'm going to give this guy a chance. It's kind of it's kind of strange. I kind of know because he was introduced to me. And as long as the new business owner or practice owner does as good job as the previous one or better, you're going nowhere. Like True. <laughs> yeah. Look, in, in saying that... Um one of the one of the big drivers would be, uh, you know, a, a potential buyer having the same similar mindset to the outgoing owner, and you know, having a, the same values on how to treat clients and you know, pricing. Um, you know, as long as that's um, very little change, there's no reason for a customer to go elsewhere. But they're if they're on different wavelengths, well, then you know, a seller should be a bit cautious because there's no guarantee you're going to get the uh, retention. Look, in any transaction, you're going to lose some clients yep. for one reason or the other, but you're going to gain clients because, just because, because business is running for the next 12 months, so you're going to, you're going to gain some clients. And I find that that normally offsets each other. That's true. And uh, in most of the practices we sold, there was no problem with achieving money in order to release the retention. Retention just gets paid on the end um, without too much trouble. Uh, talking about uh, um, retention and, like, I'm conscious to stay away from the value, and we can talk a little bit more about it because I'm sure people would be interested how much they actually sell for, but the reason why I don't want to talk about it as much because it depends on the region, it depends on the you know economy, it depends on a l- lot of things. But we can touch on that. But one thing that I wanted to say, uh, most oh, I've been dealing with accountants for years now, and there was a time, and still kind of is, when the accountants were worried about uh, or thinking of getting in consultancy because they they worried that the technology. It's going to make him obsolete from pure um, uh, task, tax lodgements. But every time when people are looking to buy accounting practices, they're actually not as, not as excited about uh, consulting part, but they want 
pure compliance because compliance is where the security of income is. And let's face it, it's not getting any any simpler. Like the the tax laws are changing on, on a daily basis. And well, you, well you, what's your thought on it? You only have to have a look at the last uh, two years with COVID. The amount of work that's gone to accountants is unbelievable. Like you know, I don't think there'd be one accounting firm that would have had a decline in income in the last year or two because clients have clients are pushing a lot more to accountants for their uh, compliance work. They're pushing a lot more there for, you know, the the government assistance, putting those things together. So I, I just feel, uh, you know, uh, like five years ago, six years, years ago, people was was telling me that, you know, I, I returns would be phased out. Uh, you know, yeah. there's going to be less done by accountants because there's going to be a, a simplified tax system. I haven't seen. <laughs> you I haven't have seen see that. <laughs> haven't seen much of it. So, so, so this question about the COVID and uh, um, this out of the ordinary work that the accountants needed to do, has that treated during the sale? Is that excluded in, from the calculation because it may not going to happen in the future? Or is that Look, I'll look give that? I'll give a couple of examples yep. um, that that come up have come up in in my uh, travels, where you've got a client that hasn't done a tax return for five years, and in the two, twenty-one year, for example, you had to do five lots of tax returns that might have totaled twenty thousand. That's not going to be recurring, so you really can't you can't apply the multiplier to that. You've really got to apply it to a normal year. And I, I think the same could be said with COVID work as well. Well, I would I would challenge that a little bit, all right? Maybe COVID work because it was a huge influx of work. But accounting practice that's got a few hundred uh, clients, just about every year is going to have somebody <laughs> who's True. behind and you're going to have a five or six uh, tax returns in one go. And I think that's tre- that's addressed with retention. Yeah. So if you're looking at the turnover that we want to achieve and turnover is X, well, if you don't have those bumper clients through the year, you're going to miss that. Uh, you may not going to have the one that you had last year, but you're going to have somebody somebody else this year. True. Yeah. Uh, and but, but, but back to this uh, advisory work that the accountants provide, you know, May gonna be restructure, may gonna be business advisory, sitting on someone's board, and you know regular, regular work for for the companies. Uh, how much of that is in most of the transactions that you do? To be honest, I think most of it's recurring work, with the practices I've seen. But that's not to say there aren't practices that do a lot of consulting work. Mm-hmm. And if the consulting work, you know, is every year two hundred thousand or three hundred thousand, well, you know, it's it's recurring. It's there. Like it's there. It so exists, yeah. it might be different customers from year to year, but you know, you always get that client that wants consulting from year to year. So I, I think you have to put a value on that as well. Okay, let's touch on these valuations. I wanted to stay out of it, but it's impossible. Yeah. All right. So what the accounting practices sell for? Look, I, I'd have to say. Um, Five years ago, let's go back a little bit. Um, I returns were selling between fifty and sixty cents, and um, business returns from a dollar. But I think you know, with competition in the market, um, that's definitely gone up. Like I mean, we've seen some I returns being sold for seventy, eighty cents, mm-hmm. and business returns I've seen at a dollar twenty as well. So you know, there's a lot of competition out there, and if people are hungry for the deal. They will pay those sort of prices. They'll pay to get in, yeah. Look, I haven't sold many uh, mortgage books lately, but I've, I'm told, you know, $2 was unachievable a couple of years ago. Now, you know, they're talking higher multiples than two times even. Mm-hmm. Um, rent rolls, similarly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think at, at one stage it was $3. I think people are paying a lot more than that now. Why is that the case? Why all of a sudden these, these why, why all of a sudden the, the prices are pushing upwards? Just a simple supply and demand. You know, if there's demand out there, there's always going to be someone that pays more to get the deal. So you think now in 2022, there's more demand for accounting practices than was five years ago? Well, I think I think the demand is increasing all the time. Okay. I'm sure if we advertise today, Zoran, 
um, by tomorrow or the, the day after, we'd have 60, 70 inquiries to work on, serious inquiries. Yeah, it is. It is so, it you is know, I, there's, an, there's no shortage of buyers out there. And, I mean, how do you get the deal? You've got to pay more. Yeah, if you've you got to get the, in, yeah. You've got to be the one in front. You've got to give the right terms and not be ridiculous with the retention. Yeah. You've got to make it attractive for the seller. You've got to make him feel valued. And you, you've got to have the right price. If you get all those things. Because if you don't, someone else will. And someone else will. Yeah. yeah. And you've got to move fast. Yeah. Okay. So what's the best advice you would, well, best advice, any advice you would give to the buyers? I think if you do find a, a practice that's the right, the right, uh, the right fit for you, um, even if you pay a little bit more, it's like a property. If you pay a little bit more t- today, in two or three weeks' time, you look at it and say, I'm glad I did it. Yeah, well, what a good deal to us. G- and I've done it myself in the yeah. past. Uh, you know, you, for the moment you think, oh, I have paid too much. It's like when you go to the auction and you pay too much. But a year down the track, you think, oh, I'm glad I did it. Well, th- th- that's one thing. That's a really, really good thing, what you said. It's in any business. When people start negotiating, it's a $5 million deal, and now we are we start into this almost argument over $50,000. It doesn't really matter. No. As a buyer, you're going to have a years to pay that off. Think about loss opportunity if you don't purchase this business. And... and, and stay on the market for another year or two yeah how much money did you lose by by not having this business that generates uh, I- income for you so so you know look at the big picture yeah ra- rather than just uh, you know look uh, if, if, pinching. if you don't want to pay that that sort of uh, dollars put it into marketing and grow it yourself but it's going to take your time Do you okay. know on, on this note what's the acquisition cost for the accounting practice to buy the client I mean, like, how much marketing, how much networking uh, you need to do in order, <laughs> in order really to It's funny because I think a lot of accountants, are, like, the, the better accountants don't need to do much advertising. The customers find them. Yeah, but but again, like, how long it's going to take 300 clients to find you? Some to of these accounting practices they were selling are 20, 30, 50 years old. Yeah. So 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 it's a time that you're buying when you buy the the practice. So maybe you can't put it in a dollar value, but you can definitely put it in time value. So if you're buying a practice that's 10 years old, you're buying yourself 10 years of growth. Of growth. That's going to come in the future. And if you don't buy it, it'll take you 10 years. So so, so you, you you brought your eventual goal 10, 10 years closer yeah. uh, uh, to to today. Yeah, it's an interesting, interesting point. You know, there's always a... There's always an alternative. If you don't want to pay the money for the accounting practice, grow your own. Some people are very good at it. You don't need to buy it in practice. I've seen it done before. I've seen guys uh, grow practices from 300000 to a million in the space of a few years. So it, 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 it is possible. And, and how do they do it? Just well, simply, what's their secret, if you're not? <laughs> their secret is just uh, being out there, being networking, um, being amongst the right people. So it's almost... More important to be a good marketer and good salesperson than good accountant because is it possible to maybe find a have you ever seen an accounting practice that actually has got a BDM out there and bringing clients in or is that normally partner's job? I think you'll find that with multi uh, uh, accounting practices with multi uh, locations yeah uh, where you'll have a BDM that is looking always looking for clients and onboarding clients yeah. But um, certainly if I was uh, running an accounting practice, that's probably the role I would want to take is to find the clients but not be the one doing the work. So it's finding the clients and then farming it to your staff and uh, being a referral point but, you know, being the, the, the BDM of the firm. It's very different skill. Yeah, it is. Looking for the clients and actually undertaking their work once when the client is And not, not all uh, accountants are particularly good at it. Some, some are better than others. Okay. Yeah. And are there any areas of geographical areas that accounting practices are more in demand in the moment? Definitely in uh, CBD areas, uh, Sydney Metro. Sydney Metro. Yeah, and, you know, w- within the capital cities would be the, the most sought after. 
when you get to regionals, there's less less pool of people looking. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say it's not saleable. It's just less less people looking, less uh, demand. Well, you need one buyer. You need one buyer, but yeah. you know, when you've got three or four buyers um, um, making offers and the likes, you know, there's more pressure on the price going up. Correct. You've only got one. Well, look, we 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 actually currently dealing with few mm. in regional New South Wales. And there's definitely no shortage of buyers. But to your point, if same practices in Sydney, <laughs> it would be just yeah. absolutely crazy. Yeah. Like how many people would be? You'd on be it. bowled over. Yeah, <laughs> just rolled off. Yeah. Um, and uh, any any stories or or any um, from your experience? What what are the roadblocks? Or what are the the showstoppers when you're selling accounting practice? I think it's just having the seller with the right mindset to say, how can I help the buyer make this successful? If you're there helping a buyer at every step of the way, you know, it, this goes beyond the purchase price and the terms. This is, you know, offering your services to keep the clients happy, uh, as an ongoing service to the, the seller, that, that's that's the ideal world. Um, there, there's only probably one scenario that's more ideal than selling a practice is um, is having someone on your team uh, ready, willing, able to run a practice to acquire it from you because you have to remember that person probably knows all the clients anyway, so mm -hmm. the risk for him is a lot less than any new buyer. Um, I have seen some of those deals happen in the past where, you know, second in charge ends up inheriting, for lack of a better word, like a bit of a management buyout. Yeah. But I also have seen that they're much harder to finance because you can't, well, in some instances you can, but often you can't raise 100% from the bank. So the seller has to wait longer for 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 full amount of money to be handed over to him. That's right. You just have to be more flexible with, you know, when you get your money. Yeah. But, you know, if there's a trust between the second in charge and the owner um, and, you know, you've got time to, um, what's the word, plan, plan yeah. ahead, it, it can work very well. And in your opinion, price that or compensation that you're going to get for selling or handing over practice that way rather than selling in an open market, is it a... Higher, lower, or similar? I would say it'd be similar price. It's just when you get your money, and you're probably going to have to be a bit more hands-on in the practice for longer. Mm -hmm. But you know, it might be a case of over the space of five years, you you go from doing forty hours a week to twenty-five hours a week to ten hours a week to no hours a week to no hours a week. But but in in some instances, it's important to sell it because they really build the bond with those clients and don't just want to leave them to anybody. So they'd rather take a money over a longer period of time to make sure that the handover and those clients are taken care of. Um, more often than not, that's right, Zora. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, they do care about the clients. They often don't always have something to go on to after retirement. So, you know, hanging around for a while, helping the outgoing owner, it, uh, it fills a space for them as well. I sold a accounting practice quite a few years ago now and um, seller bought it from the original owner who was still in the practice. And when that seller now exited, the very original owner stayed for another two, like it was working two days a week with a few clients with the new purchasers. <laughs> it's so funny, isn't it? He never really wanted to go. Yeah. But he you know but what, he needed to. You know what the case is? He just didn't want to run the business yeah. anymore. He well, he enjoyed the social aspect, but he didn't want the run to everyone knows all how the other issues with the business that to run the business, the personnel issues, the compliance issues, they don't go away. Yeah. And generally they're the issues that uh, the outgoing owners trying to um, offload. Okay. So you know Having a relationship with clients, that's a that's a fun bit. Yeah, that's a fun bit. Uh, dealing with compliance and staff and, and the ATO and, and ATO. Yeah. That's not it's it's, it's it just doesn't end for yeah. a business owner. So uh, just 
let, let's touch on who the buyers are. Who, who are the people that buy accounting practices? Because there are people. They, they could be business that buys, but there's a, there's a person that owns that business or somebody who made a decision to buy that business. So there are always people. So who are the buyers for the accounting practices? Um, let's let's start with um, an employee, someone in their thirties, possibly forties, working for another firm, decides to go on his own. Yep. He's he's got his own, um, you know, mortgage at home, kids to raise. He wants mm -hmm. he needs an in, uh, an income from day one. Yep. He'd be an ideal per, uh, purchaser for a three hundred to four hundred thousand dollar practice because okay. he can probably raise that money from his mortgage to buy that practice. Yep. And he'll start with that base and grow it to a million in you know in this in a short time, in five some, years. Yeah. Um, I'd have to say that three hundred thousand dollar practice alone, it's difficult to make the numbers work because of the compliance issues. Okay. You know, you need people to manage those compliance issues. At three hundred thousand of revenue, it's hard to make. You know, it's hard to make it work. When you get to five or six hundred thousand, then the numbers work because you can uh, you can have staff looking after the compliance issues. And, and so forth. There's the other buyers that are um, could be another accounting firm in the, in that uh, area that wants to grow. Yep. So they might be on in the market for a similar type of practice. Um, and there's there's there are companies out there that you know are um, in the business of buying practices and growing their their uh, portfolio debt portfolio. Yeah, by, by, by as purchase. an investment. Yeah. Because okay. it, it can be run properly. It is a very good investment. What about, uh, I don't know if it's still popular, I think it's less popular, but in one stage there was a lot of financial planners that were getting in partnerships with accountants and buying accounting practices with the idea they're going to be able to leverage clients and sell them both financial services, financial planning services and accounting services. Uh, what's happening with that in the current market? Is it still going on or is it kind of um, changing? I, don't, I think that's changing. I think the compliance for planners is, has increased many times over the last few years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even if you look at value of uh, financial planning practices, I don't think they were what they used to be five or ten years ago. So, yeah, I, I'd, I'd say the, the impact of, uh, you know, People wanting to buy practices on those scenarios is probably less than it was five or ten years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I see less of it. Yeah, less. Yeah. Um, you know, whilst financial pra planning practices probably have reduced in somewhat in in value, I think uh, mortgage practices have. You know, there's more demand for them, and and also accounting practices. There's more demand. Definitely more demand for accounting practices. I agree with you. There's more accountants wishing to enter into the business and accounting practices wanted to expand their current operation than anything else. And there could be regional, there could be particular sector that you got that, that you're specializing in that they, they, they want to get uh, um, they, they they work towards. Um, anything else we should mention today on this selling accounting practices? No, I think we've covered a lot of ground yeah, today. So of ground. Look, yeah. I didn't want to get into valuation specifically because it's specific for every uh, accounting, uh, for every business. So you got to look at the characteristics of the business, spread of the clients, um, uh, uh, regions that you're operating, how close, how far away. But uh, now when I'm talking about this uh, regional um, uh, spread of the clients, I'm finding due to the to technology and partially because of Zoom and COVID that, you know, taught us how to use Zoom, that it's not as important to have a concentrated clients as it used to be, mm. go back five or 10 years ago. Uh, and I'm starting to see accounting practices that operate um, across most of the state and even in some cases nationally from one, uh, from one, um, from one place, from w when practice like this goes to the market, is there a more or less demand for it, or is just the different people that are interested in that type of stuff? I think it's a case of different people. Like I, I, I've had um, buyers that are interested in um, maybe offshoring some of the um, 
day-to-day operations, offshore even, just to mm-hmm. find efficiencies. That was a big thing five years ago, seeing less of it now. Uh, because a lot of people got caught in this offshoring trap when you would have uh, 10 people in Philippines and four people in um, Australia in the office and four people would do 80% of the, of the work <laughs> and, yeah. and and Philippines would would be responsible for, for, for completing 20%. It's not that easy. It's that, not that easy, yeah. that's right. Um, but look, you know, if, if they're uh, obviously, you know, we, we're in the business of selling uh, businesses in general and accounting practices, yeah. but um, we, we, we do appraisals uh, on, on accounting practices and uh, very rarely are we off the mark with, uh, with what we can achieve with the purchase price. I would say we're closer with accounting practices than any other businesses on what we can achieive. You know, I don't want to make it easy, but it's a little bit simpler formula. Yeah. Uh, and there are a couple of, well, there's a few red flags, if you want, and if they don't exist, yeah. or, or one or two, you can actually quantify it. Yes. Uh, what, what, what effect that's going to that's gonna have a price. So, look, if anybody listening here needs a bit of a help, uh, call Mr. Mark Attard and uh, Happy to help. Uh, happy to help. And uh, we'll look, you know, without any obligations or anything like that, we'll have a look what, what, what it's worth, give you a bit of advice and then, you know, you can decide what you want to do with this if you want to take it further or you want to plan or grow or, or sell. E- even if, uh, you know, you want to use me as a sounding board, I'm happy to, to help out. I had a guy the other day who was buying a practice off his, uh, off his boss and I was just running some numbers with him and uh, it made him feel comfortable with what he was doing. So, Well, sometimes, you know, just by talking to somebody else, you give yourself the answers. So he's a marketer, the sounding board, <laughs> if anybody needs him. <laughs> Give a Mark a call. Mark, how, how do people find you? Just go on our website, exclusive.com.au. Uh, I'll oh, do that or um, ring me direct, uh, 0430 001. There you go, Mark. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Zora. It was for, good to be here. Your talk and hopefully people get uh, a lot out of this little chat we had. Thanks, Mark. Thanks again, Zoran. Need help selling your business? Buying a business or a business valuation. Exclusive Business Sales award-winning team are here to help. Our experience, skill, expertise and professionalism, backed by our triple guarantee, is assurance for your success. The largest network of buyers and our national coverage will help you throughout Australia in all state capitals and regional areas. Exclusive Business Sales. Sell your business with certainty.